All right. Hopefully everybody is seeing my screen and I have not muted you. So just be just be quiet. <laughs> anyway, but you're in the right spot. This is personal creativity through cartooning. And my my thought here was just to tell you a little bit about myself first uh, to see why I, I feel like I could do uh, something like this. Um, when I got out of college, one of the things that I wanted to do was to learn how to draw. And um, I spent much of my 20s uh, in that pursuit, taking classes like at Mass Art and the museum school, just evening classes, that kind of stuff, and working part time during the day. And uh, I got to be able to draw pretty well. Um, never got to really be an artist, but that was fine because the process was, uh, was important. I learned a lot. Um, what I'm showing here are a couple of things that I've drawn fairly recently. So on the left hand side, this is what I drew when I was growing a, a pandemic beard and you can kind of see how I mix a little bit of text and the self portrait in there. Um, on the right was our Christmas card. We've been doing Christmas cards for well, since since Amy and I got married. And this is kind of the general style that I, I work with, you know, line and very simple color um, and a little bit of text. And, you know, I try to integrate it into my life to some extent. I keep a sketchbook. I've kept a sketchbook since I was 30. Uh, you know, Christmas time, I'll draw uh, tags for, um, for, for gifts. And, oops, looks like we got somebody coming in. So I'm gonna admit them in. Um, so it's just something I like to do, you know, draw postcards, send them to people, that kind of stuff. Uh, it's not a professional thing for me, but I've learned a lot from work done, particularly by one, um, one artist named Linda Berry. And we'll do some exercises that she, um, you know, she, well, taught me through her books, basically. So let's, let's start here. Part one is, is making your mark. And the idea here is from this image of, you know, hands on a cave wall in Argentina is that, you know, human beings like to make their mark in one way or another. Um, and in this case, it might just be putting your hand against a rock and blowing pigment against it. And, uh, you know, for reasons of humidity or, or rock or whatever, um, they've been there for thousands and thousands of years. But just, uh, you know, there's a very basic need of human beings to express themselves. Um, here's another cave drawing, which I like uh, particularly. You look at this horse and you think, this is somebody who really knew horses. I mean, drawing horses' legs is not easy. Um, and there's also a very nice feel for uh, uh, texture and color and line work uh, in this piece. And I think, um, you know, for whatever we might do tonight, a lot of what we're going to be thinking about are, are details and trying to express in one way, maybe not entirely realistically, because this, this is an awful fat horse, um, but it's a very expressive horse. So um, here we are with uh, hieroglyphics. Um, what is this, 13th century BC? And uh, for me, when I think a lot about images and words, hieroglyphics are the perfect combination of putting the two of them together. Um, it's just a fascinating that those would come, come together as one. Uh, here's a illust uh, illuminated manuscript and uh, the little red inset on the left hand side is blown up on the right. And so you get really to see what, I mean, you know, the, you can see how Monty Python and the Holy Grail, their <laughs> animator is a Terry Gilliam, I think, uh, was inspired by drawings like these, which in a way seem very old and yet very modern at the same time. Uh, love this kind of line work and, and, and coloring. Um, one of the things I never really was able to learn in, uh, you know, in my artist days was painterly style. So I like very much sort of just doing line work and coloring it in. And that's what these folks were doing. And yet look how expressive it is. I mean, the, uh, the couple that's kissing at the bottom and they've got, a, I guess that's a, I mean, it's, it's a hawk, I think on a gloved hand. Um, just what an amazing little drawing. Um, some of you may have seen some of these kinds of drawings. So this was done by a Lakota Indian named Red Horse in 1881. And that's about five years after the Battle of the Little Bighorn. And that's what's being depicted here. So this is someone who obviously knows horses very well, uh, was um, on the battlefield, uh, depicts in sometimes very gruesome style what was happening there. 
um, and shows sort of the chaos that goes on on the battlefield. Um, I have another example that I think is interesting too. This is one that I came across in my grandfather's uh, belongings. He was uh, um, in an ambulance unit in World War I. And for a period of time when they were in the Champagne region of France, they adopted a young uh, French orphan, a boy named Roland Lebrun. And I'm not 100% sure whether Roland did these drawings, but I have a strong hunch that he did. And this is a, uh, a, you know, a young teen, I think he may have been 13 or so, uh, view of war. And if you look at the, the motion and the action that is captured in these drawings, uh, it's really fantastic. It's not, um, you know, it's not sort of a, uh, I don't know, an educated kind of view, but when you look at the details, when you look at the movement, um, it really is just just amazing. Um, I, I and I find it has a similarity to those drawings um, by Red Horse. So, all right, we're going to get down to our first exercise, and basically, what I want you to do is you, know, you should have a you know pen or pencil and some paper, and what I want you to do in the middle of a sheet of paper is to just write your name in capitals. You know, um, just write it in the middle of that sheet of paper. And then I want you to draw a rectangle around your name. Now, if, uh, if you're like me, Jim, uh, you got a, almost a square. If you're Michaela, chances are you've got a long, long rectangle. And what I want you to do with this rectangle is to turn it into a truck as drawn from the side. So, you know, if you got a long name, you may have a 16 wheeler. Uh, you know, you may have a box truck or a van or depending, you know, whatever it is. Um, think about the details that make a truck a truck, you know, a cab out front, how many wheels, whatever you might see from the side and, um, you know, windows, bumpers, headlights. And think about that. Um, start drawing that. I'm going to give you about two minutes for this. And, you know, as, as you go along, if you want to add other details that give it a setting, you know, like a road or signs or other cars or whatever, go ahead and do that. You've got two minutes and I will let you know when we're getting close to time. All right, we're about a minute in. You got another minute. You know, if you've if you finish some parts, think about adding details. All right, you got about 15 seconds, so start wrapping up. All right, let's stop there. Now, again, I, you know, my, my feeling here is have a look at what you drew. Did you get the basic essence of a truck? Would someone looking at that drawing be able to identify it as a truck? Um, what kind of details did you have? If you look at it later on, what kind of details might you have missed that you would add if you had more time? Uh, I, you know, it's a, a very basic exercise, but just to make the point that you can, uh, you can make a very, uh, I'd say, passable truck 
uh, without a lot of trying. So I'm going to go a little bit around the history of cartooning. And that's my next section. And we'll have an exercise coming up in a little bit. Um, this guy, who I hadn't heard of before this past week, uh, is a, uh, from Switzerland. His name is Rodolf Tüpfer. And uh, his name was mentioned actually in the cartoon uh, Zippy last week by Bill Griffith, um, if you see him in the globe. Um, but you look at this detail, this line art, the intermixing of text, a story that kind of goes from right to left. Um, you know, you don't necessarily, well, I didn't even try to read this because I think it's in French. Um, but you know, you, you, you see the progression of the story as it goes along. Uh, this, is, um, this is almost an example of something you see over and over again, which is uh, human beings drawn with animal heads. Uh, this is by a guy named J.J. Granville, or actually it's inspired by him. There was a book done called Les Metamorphoses du Jour um, that took some of his famous cartoons and other uh, artists sort of reproduced them. Um, but this idea of beasts of burden with all kinds of different heads, uh, you know, I, I think is so beautifully done. And this is someone who you tell could really, really draw, could draw humans, they could draw animals uh, in a very, very realistic kind of way with, with a simple use of color. Uh, I was a German major in college. And uh, one of the, the, the artists that I came across was a guy named Wilhelm Busch, a uh, German who wrote a series called Max and Moritz. Uh, it's 1865 or so. And they were just a couple of Hellraiser kids. Here, I think they're putting pepper into their dad's pipe. And they did all sorts of stuff like that, getting in, in, in trouble right and left. Um, moving into the 20th century, uh, this is a guy whose, whose style I've tried to emulate in some of the things that I've done, uh, a guy named John Held. And here he's talking about Jesse James, but that dirty little coward that shot Mr. Howard has laid poor Jesse in his grave. Um, and, and I just love this graphic style. It has the feeling of, you know, things that were in, I don't know, Detective Illustrated in the, uh, you know, the, the, the late 19th century. But he was also somebody, uh, John Held, who uh, was well known for drawing flapper girls. So, you know, these uh, skinny party girls from the 1920s. And here he has done one for a Life magazine cover. Um, Crazy Cat, uh, another example here in this case of animals just uh, acting more like humans. Um, that's Ignatz on the left hand side and he's throwing a brick at Crazy Cat um, who somehow takes it as a sign of affection which is a little puzzling and disturbing. But um, of course, Mickey Mouse came into being around that time, 1928. He was in Steamboat Willie. And uh, if you had a chance to go to the Norman Rockwell Museum in 2019, uh, you would have seen an exhibit of Ro Rube Goldberg. If somebody ever is talking about the, you know, a Rube Goldberg machine, you're looking at one. This is one where um, that Professor Butts guy is trying to find some way to wipe his face without having to pick up a napkin with his own hands. So, you know, it involves a toucan and a rocket and a clock and all sorts of other stuff, really just to wipe his mouth after he takes a, a, a spoonful of soup. So, all right, we're to exercise two. And what I want to do now is to use the whiteboard. So I'm going to stop sharing for a moment and go to the whiteboard. So let me just get my notes here too. So hopefully you'll be seeing the whiteboard instead of that view now. So for this exercise, basically the idea is I wanna show you a couple of just basic tricks is about all they are. Um, and, you know, actually let me, let me stop sharing just for a moment where we do have everybody's head here for a moment. So look, look at yourself, look around at people, uh, what differentiates them? You know, their, their hair color, their uh, length of hair, their glasses, their not glasses, um, you know, what they're wearing, what their collar looks like. Um, think about that because we're gonna talk a lot about self portraits in this um, session. And so I want you to think a little bit about how you might express yourself in a self portrait uh, in a moment. But let's now go to the whiteboard. And so you should be seeing that. And let me just pick a, uh, pick a color here. 
All right. So I'm going to draw or try to draw because I'm doing it with a mouse and it's a pain in the butt to draw with a mouse. But I'm going to draw uh, two ovals side by side. If you want to join in and do this with me, that's fine. That's not necessarily part of the exercise. But if you want to do it sort of as note taking, that's fine, too. So I'm going to draw a line straight down. Well, almost straight down the middle, but kind of bisecting these two these two heads, uh, which is what I'm going to turn them into. Because if, if you think of drawing a head, this mid sector here on this side is pretty much where you would put the eyes, right? And if you go halfway down here, you'd put the bottom of your nose. And then halfway down again, that's where the mouth would go. You might put eyebrows up here. But basically, for an adult human head, that's about what the, um, the ratio is. Now you might think, oh God, that's a whole lot of space here, you know, from the eyes up to the top of the head. But honestly, that's about what it is. We all got a fair amount of brain uh, rummaging around in there. And that's, that's sort of the ratio. Now, if you're trying to draw a younger person or a baby, they've got a lot more head. Your eyes, you'd put the eyes somewhere in around here, the nose again in here, and the mouth there. And you can even see between these two very crude drawings that there's, you know, one looks more like an adult and one looks more like a kid. And cartoonists play around with these sort of proportions all the time, but that's kind of the way it goes. And again, you normally would put ears like right around the cross, you know, cross area around where that goes through, because that's about where your ears are too. And, you know, you'd add hair, or whatever, ears, you know, uh, earrings, jewelry, that kind of stuff. But that's pretty much the way it works out. I'm going to clear that for a moment because let's think about the same thing. Oh, it's so hard to draw with a mouse. Uh, but from the side, you know, again, if you're going to divide the head up like this, and imagine that the eyes are here and that the eyebrows are here and that the nose ends down here and the mouth is there. That's kind of how you might ultimately draw, you know, a, a face of a person with their ears lining up pretty much on that where, where that uh, crosses. And the same deal with a kid, because you probably, you know, would, would have the eyes much closer down here probably a more childlike little nose and a mouth. And there's your kid. Ear is going to line up pretty much to where the eye is. So that's that's kind of what I wanted to show you. Let me show you one last little goofy thing. Um, if you're drawing a cat, you can almost start with the same kind of oval. But instead of completing it, just make the ears there. And you know you can put nose and mouth in pretty much the same sort of arrangement. And it kind of makes sense, you know? Same thing if you, um, let's say you want to be Mar drawn uh, Bart Simpson. Just continue the, you know, now they're not ears here, there's his hair. But, you know, somewhere down around here, that's where his eyes end up. And again, I'm not doing a very good Bart, but it's kind of a Bart. And his mouth is, they, he has almost no chin. So, you, you know, you put his mouth down there somewhere. Um, if you, you know, when you look at what, uh, what they really do. And then if you wanted to do a same kind of thing and instead have a king instead of, you know, Bart Simpson, well, all right, here we go. There's the king. So, you know, you can have fun with this and you certainly play around with the various ratios. But, you know, the idea here is to, um, you know, just, just try and capture something about the headness of a head. So, um, what I want you to, uh, to, to do next is to use that, um, that technique. I'm going to clear this for now. Draw, you know, draw your two ovals on your piece of paper. And I want you to do a straight on view of you and a profile view of you. Um, and I'm going to give you, let me see, I'm going to give you, how about if I give you uh, three minutes to do that? And I'll tell you when a minute and a half is up. So you switch over. But so start, start drawing now. I'm going to get the timing going. On the left-hand side, I want you to do a straight on. So you're looking straight back out um, from the page. And then a profile where it's a side view. 
and you know make it yourself your glasses your hair uh if you wear jewelry your jewelry um you know if you got a mustache or you know whatever um put it in there and let's do that and you've got another basically um well, we're 30 seconds in and I'll give you to three minutes. So I'll give you a, a shout out like at a minute and a half and then maybe uh, two minutes. All right, now we're at two minutes, so you got another minute to finish up your, <laughs> excuse me, finish up your drawings, add detail, do whatever you want. All right, about 15 seconds left. All right, we're good. So, you know, I, I, I wonder how that feels. You look at your drawing now and you might say, hey, that doesn't look like me, or maybe it does. Maybe you did catch some, some essence of yourself. Um, you you know, remember in the first drawing that I did, you know, that I showed you of me with a pandemic beard, no, no one of those looked exactly like the others, but they all had glasses and similar hair and different kinds of expressions. And I think if you're able to catch a little bit of, I don't know, you-ness, um, that's great. And if not, it may be that you know what you would do to get a little bit more of you in it next time. And we'll actually have a chance to do just that later on. So, um, be prepared. So let me see. Um, just going to show you some favorites of mine now. Uh, a few more cartoonists who I found really important. Um, I think many of you will be familiar with uh, Pogo and, and Walt Kelly. Um, if not, you certainly have heard this phrase, we have met the enemy and he is us. Because whenever there is some bad thing that happens that's human related, um, uh, you don't have to think too far back in recent memory. Uh, this comes up and people quote it in the press. Um, it actually was something that Walt Kelly brought out for the first Earth Day. And so, you know, Pogo and his pal there are living in a swamp and the swamp is filling up with garbage. And he's saying, yep, son, we have met the enemy and he is us. Whoops, went the wrong way on that one. Um, now, Sylvia by Nicole Hollander was a strip I really like. I don't think she's drawing anymore. Um, but the way that she set up different situations and, um, you know, brought characters in was really fun. This is one that involves Super Cop, who just shows up at people's houses and, well, exhorts them to do various things one way or another. And I always found uh, this drawing style really nice. 
Um, not very realistic, but very, very expressive. I'll give you a moment to uh, absorb Doonesbury. I'm showing you here, like, I think the very first cartoon and then the last one he did, uh, you know, for, on the Daily Strip. We can see Sundays now, but I'll give you a moment to absorb. So um, interestingly here, I think, you see how his drawing style has evolved over time. I mean, it, very crude uh, line work at the beginning. Um, and by the time you get to 2013, uh, he, he's drawing in perspective, doing three quarter views of faces, all sorts of color added and, and elements to fill out the, the various uh, um, you know, boxes. So really an evolution of, of a cartoonist uh, artwork. Now here's Calvin and Hobbes. So uh, again, a moment to absorb this one. So here Hobbes, the, the tiger is playing the total uh, wet blanket and discouraging uh, poor Calvin. I, I hope you don't get discouraged. Um, people say they can't draw i feel like if you want to draw you can you can do it you may not be able to um match the the line quality of somebody like bill waterston who was fantastic and when you think of when he was drawing jets and dinosaurs and stuff that man could really really draw um here's uh here's something by matt gruning matt gruning's name might be familiar to you uh uh, but more likely through The Simpsons. He's the brains behind The Simpsons and that whole animated piece, but he's done all sorts of other um, books. And this is from one called uh, Life is Hell. Uh, work is Hell, Love is Hell, we're all parts of this one. And here are his characters, Akbar and Jeff, very, very simply drawn. He told uh, an interviewer at one point that he started drawing these characters, I think in third or fourth grade. And he was trying to draw Charlie Brown, but just wasn't really able to do it. You can see they're both got kind of the Charlie Brown style uh, shirt on, um, but he kept it. And of course he's a great uh, humorist and storyteller. So he does a nice job with that. Um, we heard a little bit about graphic novels before. This is from a graphic novel called Mouse by Art Spiegelman. Um, if you haven't heard uh, or read that, you, you definitely should. Uh, it's a three-part piece, um, basically inspired by his father, a Polish Jew, and his experiences during the Holocaust. And what Spiegelman did was to draw the Jews as mice, the Germans as cats, the Poles as pigs, Kind of and so on down the line, although those are the main ones in the, uh, um, you know, the narrative. And you would wonder if that could possibly work, but it does. Another uh, graphic novel that people may have heard of is uh, Fun Home by Alison Bechtel. This uh, graphic novel, and there are a lot of it, is about her relationship with her father, um, you know, and growing up. Um, it's it's a fantastic book it was turned into a um, Broadway play uh, actually uh, Amy and I saw it in the Boston area um, you may also know Bechtel from what is uh, known as the Bechtel test um, the Bechtel test is about um, films to pass the Bechtel test a film has to have two women who are named characters who talk to each other in the movie about something other than a man. And if you have that happen, you pass the Bechdel test. And sadly, um, many movies do not pass the Bechdel test. All right, we are now off to um, exercise three. What I want you to do first is to take your piece of paper and I want you to write something uh, rather than, um, than draw at first. So have a look at these um, four things. I want you to write four things, one of which is a line from a poem or a song, uh, another something you did today, um, something your mother or father might have told you at some point, 
and a question you wonder about, you know, is why is the sky blue or, or whatever. And I'm going to give you two minutes to think about that. I want you to write down uh, one for each of those. If you struggle with any of them, you know, write two for uh, one of the ideas. We just got to get in the end four statements. So I'm going to give you two minutes to do this uh, starting 10 seconds ago. All right, you got about a minute left. All right, you got 15 seconds or so. So I'll try and wrap it up. All right, that's about it. So I'm going to stop sharing here for a moment and I'm going to show you something um, which is called the Brunetti method. And this is something, let me clear this, um, that I learned from, uh, from Linda Berry uh, in one of her books. And it's named after the artist who really came up with the idea. But his thought um, essentially was that, you know, if, if you draw a stick figure, uh, it's just not very expressive. I mean, you know, there's, there's not too much you can do with it. But if you draw a large, you know, shape for the head, a large shape for the body, add squiggles as the arms and the legs, uh, maybe provide circles and, you know, like a thumb and some, some fingers for the hand. Uh, same thing over here. Uh, you can come up with, again, this is, this is a rather spooky looking uh, uh, being, but I mean, going back, we can give him a nose, eyes, mouth, ears, all that kind of stuff. We might clothe this person with certain kinds of pants or a t-shirt or something, you know. Um, what I'm asking you to do is to use the Bechdel method to draw a full standing self-portrait of you. Now take a, a piece of paper, you can fold it in half so that you have two equal sides. And on the left side, I want you to draw a self-portrait looking at the uh, looking out. And then here, I'm just gonna give you an example of what that might look like, um, you know, from the side. So facing forward and facing sideways, you're gonna do two um, Brunetti method inspired self portraits. Again, think of what you might be wearing. You haven't been thinking about your, your pants or your shoes or your socks, your belt, you know, uh, your hair, how you're going to have it. Um, but I'm going to give you four minutes for this starting now. So I want two, two drawings on a piece of paper on the left hand side, full length, uh, you looking back out at us, and the other half of the paper, you looking to the side from a profile.
So we're right around two minutes in. Um, if you haven't started on the profile yet, you should get going on that. Um, so two minutes left, we're about halfway through. So we got a minute left. Start thinking details here if you've got some time. You know, you're a soccer player, put a soccer ball in there. You got a dog or a cat, um, you know, want to put anything else there, uh, anything to, to provide a setting, go for that. You've got now about 45 seconds. About 10 seconds left. All right, that does it for that. Again, you know, step back, take a look at what you've done. Um, think about whether it captions, captures some little essence of you. Um, you know, what you might change, what you might adapt if you did it a second time around. Um, the idea here, again, is not for it to be absolutely realistic, but to maybe capture some, some little bit of you. All right, I am going to go back to the presentation now. So let me see if I can find an easy way to do that. All right, so we got a couple of things there. Let's just get ourselves to the next slide. All right, I'm going to show you a couple more favorites of mine. Um, and I'll just shut up for a while because uh, this one takes a moment to absorb. So this is Linda Berry, who I've been telling you about, who I think is so fantastic. Um, you know, she um, she met um, Matt Gruning right after college. Um, when you see uh, um, some of his early books, he calls Linda Berry the funk queen of the universe. Um, she dated Ira Glass of uh, This American Life. Um, she is now a professor at the University of Wisconsin and teaches workshops that are very, very popular. Um, if you go back to YouTube and look at some of her, I think these are 1980s appearances on the David Letterman show, some of the funniest things you are likely ever to see. Um, and I love this cartoon. Um, now you see she's drawn a child that looks like a bean basically, but it, it doesn't even matter so much. Um, and when, you know, when she picks up the child, you can see how she's reflecting what's happening with that Madonna and child in the painting, which again is very, very simply rendered. So it's just beautiful and nicely done. I love, I love this cartoon. Another one I'll let you guys absorb, this one by a guy named Tom Gold. So um, he writes for, I think it's like the New Scientist and the Economist. He does a weekly cartoon for both. Oh no, one of them is a book review magazine. Um, he's just tremendous. And here again, uh, the, the, the line work is so simple. And yet, I mean, it's obviously a dog 
and uh, you know his his human face. He doesn't even bother putting in a mouth for the woman who's saying, "Who's a good boy?" Um, and I don't know. I just just find him uh, tremendous. Uh, all right, so we're um, we're going into our next exercise. So get your pens and pencil and paper out. And this is this is an interesting one. Um, it's going to be a challenge, but I think you folks can do it. I think you're ready for this now. What I want you to do is divide up your paper into four quadrants. So, you know, just divide it into four. Um, and in each quadrant, I want to, you to draw yourself as a mermaid, you know, in the upper left, a baby in the upper right, Batman or Batwoman, as well as you can remember Batman or Batwoman. And then in the lower left and then the lower right, a queen or a king. So um, go at it, think details, think the Brunetti method um, and go for it. And I'm gonna start the clock. You have basically two minutes for each. I'm gonna give you eight minutes and uh, get drawing. Now we're about two minutes in, so pace yourselves here. You got four drawings to do and six minutes left.
So we're coming up on four minutes. That means halfway through. Um, see if you can get through and get all four done in the eight minutes we have. You're about halfway through. All right, two minutes to go. All right, we're down to the last minute here. Try and finish up. Are there any details you wanna add? Uh, this isn't a lot of time, so I'm sure you're probably rushing to finish all of them. Don't worry about that. That's the nature of it. Um, All right, 15 seconds, so start wrapping up. All right, that's it. So this is this is a rush, it's quick, but part of it is just to get you know used to sketching. Um, the next step is take those things that you wrote down and write them in one of the quadrants. So you might have the mermaid saying something that your, uh, you know, your mother or father told you. Um, pick one, put it in there. So we're going to add a caption essentially, and it's going to be from those four things you wrote. So find those, get them out, and you've got two minutes to assign those.
Okay, you got about another minute. Now you can put these in a thought bubble or just draw a line to the character or just write it in there. You got about 25 seconds. All right, 10 seconds, so wrap it up. All right, we're good. Um, I like the juxtaposition of uh, word uh, and drawing, as you can tell from what I've talked about. Uh, and I think it's fun to take something just randomly and put it in someone's mouth and see what it looks like and how it goes with the drawing. Um, I hope you had some fun with that. I, uh, I'd like if you, if you feel so moved to take a picture of this last exercise and email it to me, you don't have to, but uh, if you would, that'd be great. I'll give you my email address in a moment. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a fun exercise. I, I like it. Anyway, we're almost done. I just want to do a couple of things to wrap up. Um, one more Tom Gold comic, which I'll give you a moment to absorb, which I, I couldn't resist, and it's very topical. So again, his, uh, uh, in this case, he's doing just silhouettes. Um, and yet you know that it's the woman and the man by the, uh, the hairstyle and the, the hat, a uh, little dog in there. Um, I've shown this one in particular because um, he's, uh, he sometimes shares the sketchbook that he uses and how he um, basically used that in coming up with the idea that he had. And here again, I find it particularly fascinating uh, to see how his thought process works out, um, you know, uh, and then how he's got some really nice drawings in here, but he didn't necessarily reproduce it that way in the cartoon because of, well, whatever reason. Um, but just fascinating. I think um, another reason why it's interesting and fun to keep a, a sketchbook, whether you're you know, whether you're drawing for the, you know, the economist or whether you're just doing it for fun. So um, we're actually just about on time here, which is good. I'm gonna go back to gallery mode in a second, but I would like your, um, your thoughts on today's uh, session. Uh, what did you learn? Did you find this valuable? Um, there's a possibility for folks to continue in some way with guided exercise, take home, uh, assignments. Um, you know, if you're interested, I'm not asking for you to say anything right now, but uh, get back to me and we'll see if it goes anywhere. Uh, my email address is fairly simple and straightforward. It's jim at greenharbor.com. My website is greenharbor.com. So you can see some of the, it's really more writing than drawing that's uh, displayed there at this point, but um, that's where you can find me and let me then stop sharing. And if folks want to unmute with any comments, um, okay, here we go. Oh, okay. So I see from Michelle and Michaela, you're in Green Bay. So yeah, you're not very far from, um, from University of Wisconsin. Um, my, my, um, my sympathies uh, to the Packers, unfortunately, but uh, that was a tough game. Um, but yeah, that would be great. And I know she does things with, with uh, younger people as well. I think some of the workshops that she does for older folks um, are really hard to get into. Um, but keep an eye out for Linda Berry. She's the greatest. Um, and then uh, let me see another question. Uh, brand or type of sketchbook. I happen to like those, those um, you know, 
hand size. I don't know if I have one within arm's reach. Um, you know, sketchbooks, just blank paper inside, black on the outside. Um, those are the kind that I've used for years and years. It's not necessarily great paper or anything, um, but it's easy to carry around. And that's, that's the main thing. Uh, you know, I'll sometimes stick it just in, you know, in my belt loop and, and uh, go off on a hike and uh, sit down and, and do a drawing at some point. Uh, Joy, what was, I see you got a question. I do. I was just curious when you use your sketchbook, which I'm terrible at doing because I do paint, but I'm bad at doing a sketchbook. When you do that, do you actually colorize as you're going? I mean, do you sit there and do you have like markers or whatever that you do you color studies with while you're out sketching or? Um, I, if, if I'm like on vacation, I'll bring colored pencils um, yeah. and color there. Sometimes when I'm just out in the field, I'll actually draw little arrows and say whatever, red, blue, you know, and then come back to it later. Um, and if I'm really into it, I'll bring watercolor paper and use watercolors. Um, but a lot of times I'll just start in black and white and, uh, you know, it's probably hard for a grown man to admit, but I do like to color. Um, I do too. <laughs> and uh, so, you know, you bring, you bring it back, go, no, go on. I don't think you charged enough for the class tonight. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> it was so great. I really, really loved it. It was fun. It was Good. Will, will you consider maybe taking a photo of your, um, you know, your Absolutely. artwork? And send it? I, I would like to see that. Um, yes, I mean, the other thing too is you don't have to send it if you feel like it reveals your, um, you know, psyche in some way because of what your mother said to you, but. <laughs> Um, I, I, I just think that's neat. I see another note in here. I'm just looking. When you asked about favorite cartoonists, I thought of political cartoons. Barry Blit Bliss, New Yorker. Oh, my, my big announcement this week is I just got a subscription to the New Yorker. So I am so <laughs> excited to see the cartoons. Um, Rick, did I see your hand? Rick, right here. Yeah, go ahead. I want to get as good as Don Martin was in Mad Magazine. Oh my oh, God. I, 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 I think you'll find that Ames is a big Don Martin fan. Um, and, you know, for me, it was more trying to draw uh, um, Walt Kelly and Pogo, but so many people um, try to draw some other style. Um, and that's fine. I mean, that's just practice to get used to it. Um, you know, for a lot of you, when I asked you to draw Batman, you may not have, or Batwoman, you may not have thought of that character in a long time. And so, you know, it, it, the, the next time you go through, you realize, oh, he wears these weird gloves and oh, yeah. he's got this bat here and he's got all these gizmos and a belt and stuff. And once you think about that, the details start coming through and it starts looking more like Batman. So um, just trying to see. Lois, so what, what uh, about um, the Bern, Bernetti concept? Um, I don't think I quite all the way grasped it. It's just draw a stick figure and then go from there. Is that it? No, I, I think it's, get, it's more getting away from stick figures. So um, by making the head just some shape and the body some shape, and then not worrying so much about arms and legs because people tend to get hung up in like, oh, where's the elbow and the knee and the, you know, all of that kind of stuff. If you just draw those as squiggly lines, it opens, it opens things up. Um, mm -hmm. But the main thing is, is just start with that as a structure and build on it. I think maybe it's because it's so personal. I think drawing myself was hard for me. Like I could draw somebody else, I think. But it felt like, oh, me, I don't, I don't, I don't know. Well, this is a very personal medium. <laughs> <laughs> but no, um, yeah, it, it's funny. I, I've, trying these things out, it's, it's hard um, to really know how it'll work in a class like this. I mean, the last time we did something like this, it was, um, it, it was for the, you know, for the church in person and like 20, 25 people showed up and I was prepared for about 10. And about a third of those people were kids, um, you know, really young folks. And on the fly, we sort of worked out how to, 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 to make it happen. And it worked pretty well, but you know, there was one person who came into the class thinking I was gonna teach him realistic drawing and that was not happening. And so they left. So it's, it's really hard to, uh, 
you know, with, with an audience, figure out what's going to be the right thing for everybody. How do you get an economy of line? Uh, say that again, Rick. How do you get an economy of line? I look at mine and like I go over things and it's like the good cartoonists seem to have a definitive way of using lines that are clean. Yeah, um, that's bad. I mean, some of that also is tools. So, you know, I mean, if you look at Tom Galt, it seemed like he uses basically the same thickness pen for a lot of his lines. Um, and there are others who will use like sort of quill pens so they get real variation in line and people are really, you know, almost picky about that stuff. Um, I, I find one of the things that I've been doing and you notice it if you look at the difference between like that drawing that I showed early on of mine, one was much more a sketchbook drawing and another one was one where I went through several versions and used uh, a light table. So I would draw it once find things I like, draw it again. Um, I was also using, um, I would figure out where the text would go and I would actually type it out and then I would write over it. So when my normally just do handwriting, you know, my regular uh, whatever block text is fairly legible, but it gets really legible if I lay on, you know, lay on top or trace essentially over actual typeset text. So I mean, I think some of the economy of line for these folks comes through multiple iterations. Right. Well, thanks well, and, so much. Yeah, and talent. <laughs> <laughs> and Jim? Um, yes. I do have one comment about economy of line because it reminds me when my son Adam, who was a pretty good artist, although he doesn't do it as much as he used to, when he was a little dude, he would, uh, this is when Buzz Lightyear and um, uh, Woody and that whole- uh, Toy Story. Toy Story came out, yeah. He would draw those characters as a four or five year old. And like you said, just do the simple lines, but you knew right away which character he was drawing. Mm -hmm. and it was, you know, he knew how to do it simply. And if I tried to draw it, it'd be all confusing, but he just went right to the, the heart of the matter. And I thought, you know, children have a certain viewpoint of it that's, you know, very, uh, exact so well and so certain things may stand out bigger to them in a sense um you know whatever the hat woody star the gun on his belt his boots um was his astronaut you know? yeah all of those things um linda barry talks a lot about getting people to forget about how they um what they learned about drawing and just go back to the way they drew before they um thought that everything they drew was terrible <laughs> so anyway i don't know any other questions all right well then i think we are done uh my yeah, email thank is you, Jim. Thank, you, thank you so my email is jim at greenharbor.com send me uh you know send me your drawing if you want if you think that there's you know we could do a four session thing or we could figure out something else to do if you're interested let me know thank you very much thank, thank, you, so thank much. you all right folks you all take care Good night. Yeah, good night. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.